also on our website. So I am now going to turn things over to Michelle. Michelle, are you ready to take us on a tour of Christmas? I sure am. Thank you so much, Alex, for the wonderful introduction. Hello, my everybody. Um, my name is Michelle Muro, and I'm the collections coordinator at the Homestead Museum. Um, now, we at the Homestead Museum interpret um, broadly California history, but more specifically Los Angeles region. And we uh, talk about a century's worth of history um, within uh, the state of California. Uh, we do, however, um, focus on certain decades, which we will see throughout the presentation. And those decades are the 1840s, the 1870s, and the 1920s. Now we see extreme changes and some similarities linking the past to the present. Um, so that is why we really focus on those particular decades. Also, the Workman and Temple Family Homestead Museum title should tell you a little something about the other focus that we have. And that is the uh, family, the Workmans and the Temples who were vanguards of the early, uh, early California history. And we talk about the temples and the workmen's as case studies and to share their family stories to kind of see within context how history affected people like the workmen and the temples. And so we will be visiting two of their homes, which encompass two historic uh, uh, residences that make up our museum. Now, um, Christmas at the homestead is I will say one of the most elaborate of exhibits and um, collections coordinator may not really tell you what I do, but basically I am a curator. So I focus on the preservation of over 30,000 objects and I am in charge of creating exhibits for the historic homes, um, which is La Casa Nueva or the new house, which is a 1920s mansion and the Workman Home, which is an 1840s adobe. Now, the inspiration that I get for these uh, particular Christmas decorations, um, whether they're um, actual Christmas decorations from the time period um, or their reproductions, all come from primary sources. And we are very fortunate in that we have a plethora of objects in the collection, whether they are magazines or photographs, um, pamphlets that really share uh, the history and help us research and really be as historically accurate as we possibly can. Um, so with that, I hope you enjoy this behind the scenes virtual tour. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask or share any of your traditions or your memories of your favorite holidays, whether it's Christmas or, or, or not. So um, again, I hope you enjoy. So we will get started now. So this image is of the Workman House. This is um, the first stop that we will see uh, a room in the home that really talks about early California and how um, Christmas was celebrated. Now, this was the home of William and Nicolasa Workman. They lived in this home for over 30 years from about the 1840s and, uh, until the 1870s. And then later on, their uh, grandsons took over the care of the land and the home. Now, California uh, Christmas during the 1840s, although Christmas uh, during this time did not have the widely recognized decorations of today, there are perhaps some traditions that have lived on, whether they are community-based celebrations, um, religious observances, food and entertainment, um, all of these survived. And then you have these images here. On the left is an early uh, Catholic church in the Los Angeles region, uh, St. Babanias, near the Placito Olvera in downtown Los Angeles. And you have an image of the illustration of a play, uh, Las Pastorelas, as well as an image of a scary looking devil mask that has um, an important role in this particular play, which we'll talk about. 
Now the townspeople would gather to watch a play um, after having attending mass at St. Babania's church with most of the population, which was about 2000 residents uh, at the time, inhabitants, predominantly of Catholic faith, um, they would attend a church just like that illustration. Now the play uh, was called Pastorelas and it centered on the theme of good versus evil. So it involved shepherds uh, while attending their flock were informed of the birth of uh, Jesus Christ by an angel. And um, as they began their trek to, to visit the newborn Christ, it is said that the devil um, tried to um, stop them and basically told them that this announcement was false, that the son of God was not born and to go back. Now, of course, Archangel St. Michael comes in to save the day and he um, vanquishes the devil and he uh, really uh, protects the shepherds and leads them to uh, the newborn Christ. Now, the role of the devil was played by the last Mexican governor of Alta California um, when California was part of Mexico and that governor was named Pio Pico. Um, he is interred in our uh, mausoleum in one of our, uh, in one of, in the cemetery that we have. And it's one of the oldest privately owned at one time cemeteries in the region. Now he would play the role of Pio Pico and the mask there would be something that he would probably have worn. Um, early 1840s devil masks um, would have been made out of uh, possibly wood carved wood. And if there wasn't horns from an actual animal available to be attached to the masks, you would use uh, tree branches and the mask would be painted. Sometimes um, uh, sheepskin would be used as well. So of course, after having um, enjoyed the Pastorella's uh, play, townspeople would feast on a meal. And of course, what celebration is not a celebration? A celebration is not a celebration without good food. No matter where in the world we are, food is an integral component that really connects us all. And so in the 1840s, um, a feast would possibly consist of pozole, which is a soup-based um, hominy-filled deliciousness. And it would have meat and mostly pork meat, and it would be um, served with the, the meat broth. And also a warm beverage called athole. Now athole was made of toasted corn flour or dough, um, which is essentially masa. And you add a nutmeg and cinnamon, and the combination is a thick, delicious meal in a cup, really. And for dessert, something like bunuelos, which was a, a, it still is a fried sweet bread and even coffee. Now I have heard of uh, folks asking, well, what's the difference between atole and champurado? Well, champurado, if you're aware of it, is also a very thick beverage um, and it's made in, it's really, its origins are from Mexico. And it's again, a form of atole, but it has, chocolate and now but it depends on what region you're at in Mexico just like mole each region has its own different ingredients but delicious nevertheless now cascarones a fun form of letting people know you really care by smashing eggs on their heads now this originally started in Spain and then was adopted into um Mexican culture in the 1800s. And what cascarones are is really they're emptied eggshells that are filled with um, originally perfume and then um, confetti or colorful strips of paper. But now mostly we still see cascarones being used for um, say observances and, and celebrations for Easter. And so it is said that having a cascarone broke broken over uh, your head will bring you good luck. And it is a symbol of affection. 
Now, the process took weeks and led many to, to consume eggs um, so as not to waste the nutritious meal. And a humorous account that we know of was written by a man by the name of William Garner. And he was a resident of uh, the region. And it gives us insight into the process as he describes how tired he was of consuming eggs for days on end and was clueless as to why many young women kept smashing eggs over his head. He perhaps did not understand of the well-intentioned uh, uh, message behind the activity. We also uh, have accounts of citizens, residences of the time of early Los Angeles, describing the excitement of the day as they watched the decorated horses of the California ranchers coming through with their caretas or their wagons that were colorfully um, decorated and of town folks passing through to join the communal uh, festivities. So although we may not see the Christmas tree or of course Christmas lights, um, ornaments that we recognize uh, typically as uh, Christmas orientated decorations, there were there was no lack of uh, community um, gathering celebration that involved um, entertainment like the play and cascarones. So we will see how some of these um, observances and traditions have changed um, and how some have really stayed the same. Now what we're looking at is a video of what is currently on exhibit in the workman house and it is in the West Room. Now this is clearly a lot different than what the images we were seeing on the first slide that talk about 1840s uh, Christmas. We are now entering a different period of the 1870s, um, which was uh, showed some changes between the 1870s and the 1840s. So by the 1870s, California had experienced um, significant changes with its shift from being land that once belonged to Mexico then becoming part of the US and the ability to travel to California not only by boat and overland but also by train all helped to bring forth an increase in its inhabitants that ushered in a more diverse population of people settling in California from different parts of the country and from the world all over. This would have an impact on Christmas and how it was celebrated with the introductions of different types of decorations and activities that would become some of the most recognizable traditions of the holiday. Now, the Christmas tree is arguably one of the most recognizable symbols of the holiday. However, its importance was just as significant to the ancient pagans during the pre-Christian era and as seen as a renewal of life in celebrating um, the winter solstice. Even before this iconic illustration of Queen Elizabeth and Prince Albert, who was a native of Germany, uh, with their children surrounding the tabletop tree, before it made its way to America, first by uh, Gaudet's uh, Lady Book in 1850, there are accounts such as Queen Victoria's diaries um, and her entries as a younger woman with her description of a tree illuminated with tapers or candles. Uh, historians believe um, that the custom originated in places such as Germany, Germany and England. It was a matter of time. This would become um, something introduced and adopted and embraced in the US tradition by way of its new settlers from England and Germany and other areas of that um, world. However, there is no doubt that the queen's influence had a significant impact. Now, initially, um, all the ornaments that hung on the tree were homemade. Uh, some of them included paper cornucopias filled with treats, um, such as fruit and nuts, or adornments made from cotton wool with embossed paper faces surrounded by lace trim. Eventually, imported ornaments, mostly from Germany, made their way to store shelves in the US during the 1870s. Such ornaments included lead-based stars, crosses, moons, and animals or glass blown, glass blown ornaments as well. 
Before electricity became a revolutionary way to illum illuminate the world, candles were used on trees. And as a consequence, many a fire would break out, causing property damage and even worse, loss of life or serious burns. So this is why we see the bucket down at the second image you see there, right on the right-hand side, filled with water nearby in preparation to douse a fire. Now, Christmas scenes during the 1860s. Um, we see scenes and illustrations such as uh, these we see here on the screen, even before the decade of the 1870s in illustrated newsprints published back East, such as Frank Leslie's and Harper's Weekly um, newspapers. And they start to show not only tabletop trees as a slowly adopted tradition or trend, but also the use of evergreen garlands. So these decorating styles would eventually find its way to the far west of California. 1870s Christmas gifts. Now, for Christians, the act of gift giving, uh, this is tied to the three wise men bestowing their gifts and their offerings to the newborn Jesus. But as is the case with the symbolism of the evergreen tree, the origins run even further. Now, specifically to another pagan festival known as Saturnalia, which was a Roman holiday and celebrated in honor of Saturn, the god of agriculture, and it involved many aspects, but one of which was gift giving. Later, such exchanges was tied to uh, Saint uh, Nicolaus of Myra, who was known for his acts of generosity and was later known as Saint Nicholas, then evolving into the creation of Santa Claus. With the gradual domestic manufacturing capabilities and, and consumerism demand, we start to see the gifts being advertised, advertised more and more in Los Angeles-based newspapers, such as the Evening Republic on the uh, left and the Morning Journal on the right. Some of the goods advertised range from silk clothing, books, children's wind-up toys, and even wooden alphabet blocks, to name a few. Michelle? However, yes. We have, you've sparked some memories and one viewer, Claudia on Facebook, um, when you were talking about the tabletop trees was saying that when she was younger, they had real candies on the tree. And so oh, that's a memory fun. that came back for her. Yes, and it was even really nice to see through research that um, there sometimes would be um, small books that would hang from the branches, but to have a book and a treat like that would be so much fun. Thank you for sharing that very beautiful memory. Um, so gifts not only included um, these store-bought um, objects, but also something that we might kind of think, well, huh, really oranges were considered a, a luxurious gift? Yes, they were. Now, California being one of the major states that produce citrus um, fruits, we have it year round. So imagine receiving a gift from your friend in the wild west of California and you're suffering in the snow in New York and you get to have a juicy ripe orange that you couldn't find anywhere in New York at that time. It was sure a, a luxurious um, and thoughtful gift, I think. Um, now, speaking of gifts and consumerism, um, this would not be something as explosive in terms of consumerism and commercialism of goods until the 1920s. Um, the ads belong to stores that, um, that you see here. Um, they belong to stores in downtown LA. And the commercialism and consumerism, we will see how it was much more pronounced in the next decade. But um, Coulter's and Santa Claus headquarters, Dunsmore and Alice dollar stores um, sold many different things, again, from silk textiles, which are clothing pieces, to um, trimmings and um, toys and uh, kitchenware and much more. So there was a plethora of goods to be had. And we can obviously start seeing this demand for easy store-bought, if you could afford it, goods. 
Now, Christmas cards, as is the case of the Christmas tree and gift giving, the exchange of Christmas greeting cards would not be popular in the United States until about uh, the 1870s. Louis Prang, a German native, had a print shop near Boston in which he printed some of the first Christmas cards in the country. As evidence of the first two cards um, with the snowy um, scenery there, and it's um, in the middle there as well, and the other greeting card with the young girl on the front, um, we can see the uh, depicting of nature-based scenery, which was much more admired and appreciated for some reason um, during the Victorian era. Now, community celebrations, I think, um, changed a little bit from the 1840s to the 1870s. Michelle, um, um, before we go into the community celebrations, I want to share a comment that came in um, on Zoom here from Geneva, um, who says that um, her parents are from southern Louisiana, and as small children, an orange and walnuts may very, were very much prized gifts, <laughs> as they may not have been available in the Deep South. That's wonderful. Yeah, I think um, finding a stocking filled with with walnuts and apples and oranges, just the aroma brings back childhood memories for me. I know my father, um, every year without fail, we would have, although we grew up poor, we would have our Christmas um, presents, store-bought Christmas presents, but I always treasured the stocking that he would make sure to fill with candy canes, walnuts, hazelnuts, almonds, and oranges. So I, I truly understand that. And even the smell to this day reminds me of um, Christmas. <laughs> Thank you also for sharing that memory. Now, uh, regarding community celebrations in the 1870s, um, Christmas dances and balls became more prominent in the US as seen on the ad on the right and the letter on the left. Now the letter was written by an, a man named Joseph Walter Drown who was adopted by the Temple family. And he writes to John H. Temple who was one of the grandsons of the man that owned the home with the tabletop Christmas tree. So uh, Joseph writes to John in 1874 who was away at school um, and letting them know of the festivities that were in town. And he describes the Christmas balls and or Christmas dances and two Christmas trees to be decorated in the local town of Almonte. So it's possible that he might have been talking about that grand Christmas dance that we see there um, with that ad of Fourth's Hotel and on the night of December 25th. So Christmas during the 1920s in La Casa Nueva or the new house. Now, as we enter La Casa Nueva virtually, right? <laughs> or the new house, um, it is um, something that I'd like to mention that it was, uh, it belonged to Walter P. Temple and his family. And Walter was one of the grandsons of William Workman who owned the 1840s Adobe. And we will see how Christmas was celebrated during the 1920s with significant changes and similarities to the past. Um, there is no doubt that the wealth of the Temple family um, afforded them many luxuries, most evident in the house itself. And we can only surmise what holiday decor they would have likely purchased to celebrate the Christmas season by researching pamphlets, books, photographs, and advertisements found in magazines at the time. Now, this is also something I'd like to stress. Um, not everybody in California during the 1920s were able to afford such a luxurious home. This home is um, also very symbolic of the, really the appreciation of early California history from the viewpoint of the 1920s. Um, this home is a Spanish colonial revival in its architecture and its um, features, architectural features indicative of such uh, type of uh, architecture is shown in the wrought iron um, 
lamp posts, the uh, red tile on top of the roof, and the thick adobe walls, um, to name a few. Now, this home was really uh, more than just a lavish display of wealth. Um, studying Walter's family history, really, this was also very symbolic of Walter's love of California history and how proud he was of his family's role in early California history. And so it's really a beautiful symbolism of family love and love for California. Now this video is in the living room of La Casa Nueva, which is the 1920s mansion. Please. We'll give it just a second. There we go. So looking at the living room, we can clearly see changes in decoration types, most notably the revolutionary electric based lights. Now the first incarnation of lights were just as dangerous as an open flame candle in my opinion, due to its carbon filament, which burned much hotter than its later tungsten filament. Now it is estimated that in 1900, a string of 16 bulb lights could cost up to $12 in 1900. That is equivalent to our modern $350 for a string of lights. But by the 1920s, the average cost started at around a dollar uh, per box. And I've seen um, examples of um, boxes of eight to about minimum of eight bulb string lights, about $6, which was still a hefty price considering that in the 1920s, if you were lucky to have a really good steady income and to be able to really live comfortably, that meant you um, garnered about $50 per month. Um, so also other changes that we see um, are cray paper or paper streamers. Now um, we see an image on the right here of the same area we saw the video of, and that was La Casa Nueva's living room. And um, the image on the right is one of the photographs in our collection that um, shows an interior of a Los Angeles home during about the late 1900s to early 1920s. And you can see it's fully decorated with streamers coming from every corner of the room. And sometimes I'm able to decorate with as much crepe paper, but this year um, we can only do a, a limited amount um, due to the fact the, that we are in a pandemic and, and, and it's um, quite, um, um, hard to get to the, the homestead sometimes we have to work from home. Michelle, so, yes, we're bringing up more um, memories and I love that so many of them are uh, <laughs> about fruit because we have we have one that came in on Facebook from Heather who is from Canada and she remembers that definitely a Christmas treat were imported Japanese mandarin oranges. Yes. And they would only be available at Christmas time. They would be individually wrapped in tissue in a small wooden crate that then she would reuse later as a doll's bed, which is so sweet, isn't it? That's a beautiful memory. Thank you for sharing, Heather. Now, speaking of cray paper or paper streamers, I like to call it the 1920s was the cray paper craze, really. Not only were uh, folks encouraged to use this during Christmas time, but I've seen examples of uh, cray paper step-by-step um, -step guides, how to make a Halloween costume out of cray paper. I know if I wore anything cray paper, it would not last. But um, the major cray paper manufacturing company during this time um, was Denison's. It started out as a jewelry box uh, making company back east, 
But by the um, 1920s, it was the leading source for paper products, holiday gift bags. Um, by the 1990s, though, the company merged with Avery and um, they um, are no longer an entity on its own. And Avery, if, if you're aware of, is a leading company that sells office supplies to this day. So the Denison's company um, really found its niche in creating um, decorations that were paper-based. They started seeing the demand, especially in the 1920s for this. And they had a variety of colors as you see in the middle there. And another example of a fully decorated living room for Christmas celebration on the right. More on cray paper. Um, as you can see by the example found in the Montgomery Ward Fall and Winter Catalog, 1928 and 29 um, on the left and on the bottom, that is from the Los Angeles Broadway department store ad, um, all which helped to inspire uh, me and my team to create what you see there at the top, which was one holiday season, one, uh, I believe that was a couple of years ago, and we decided to decorate around the chandelier. So we really didn't need the um, chandelier cray paper <laughs> that you see on the left, we had our own. So we just simply decorate it with cray paper bells. And it's interesting that we could get six inch cray paper bells, three of them for 10 cents, eight inch cray paper bells, um, three for 15, and then all the way to the large 18 inch uh, cray paper bells for 25 cents each, which seems cheap to us, but was still kind of expensive for folks, um, working folks in the 1920s. Now, over the fireplace. Although not as identical as the 1920s example image on the left, uh, living area and fireplace, the decorations were still um, picked based on its similarities. So as we strive to be as historically accurate based on the general research, um, we also take note of the Temple family personal history. Now, for example, the nativity scene um, that is placed on the mantle there um, is a holiday piece and one that would be typically found in a home, um, especially if they were of Catholic uh, Christian faith. And the temples were Catholics who were very much involved in their local um, Catholic church. So 1920s Christmas tree. Now for the inspiration of this towering tree seen in this image, we looked uh, to research of secondary sources. Uh, so for example, uh, to find the inspiration for this, what was called a double decker, eight to nine foot tall tree, we looked to places like Hearst Castle um, and to other images in our collection that would give us a great visual of how a tree would uh, be fully decked out during the 1920s and all its tinsel glory. Now this tinsel um, was originally made with lead. So we do have um, 1920s tinsel. So we're very careful using nitrile gloves to protect our, um, ourselves when we use this tinsel. And these are images again from our collection. They are from all Los Angeles, Southern California, interior residence shots of their living room. Um, they're different families. One on the left is, um, um, I believe it's uh, sisters. And then one on the right are, of course, our siblings as well, the brother and sister. And these early pho photographs in 1920s not only give us a great example of different ways in which folks in the 20s decorated their Christmas trees, but also if you look on the bottom, it is a clear indication of the type of toys that um, a pretty well-off middle-class family would be able to afford their children. And by the looks on the faces, on some of the kids' faces, they look quite pleased, especially the little boy with his, his bicycle there. Now, connections to the past. For as much as the um, 
Roaring Twenties ushered in many changes um, with some Christmas decor. Um, some of it remained popular, such as the tabletop tree. On the left is a silent film actress named Nancy Carroll, who stressed that Christmas party planning should be started early. And the young child with the seated in front of the other tabletop tree is from a Kodak camera pamphlet that stressed that its purpose was for the amateur photographer. So now we are starting to see the availability of, of cameras really um, on the market, not just for photographers in, who had studios in downtown Los Angeles, but for folks who wanted to capture their memories um, with a Kodak camera and lucky for historians and curators like us that we have those particular primary sources today. Um, the middle image shows a close up of the table that is in the living room. Now, this shows Victorian era ornaments and toward the middle there, some with lace surrounding them and um, angel face figures attached to it. And then we see um, the um, 1920s garland. Now that particular box, the box on the left that has the kind of brownish looking garland on it is a curator and historian's dream come true. When we received that particular um, box, it had on the inscription on the front, uh, family Christmas trimmings of 1928. So we know automatically it was someone's beloved Christmas decoration um, and it was from 1928. So it was pretty awesome to receive that particular object. And we see the Christmas star with the um, five, was it, five bulbs um, made out of Noma bulbs. Now Noma Mazda GE were the leading manufacturing um, companies of Christmas bulbs in the 1920s in particular. Now we see more advertisements and examples of Christmas gift giving. And in particular, I was really excited upon doing more deeper research to find that we actually had um, ads that were found in Montgomery Ward catalog for 1928 and 29 that shows specific tabletop games that were um, advertised as great um, gifts. One of which was the pit game as well as a touring popular game so touring is, is um, similar to, the, if you're familiar with tabletop or, or card games, Millbourne, the traveling game, really fun to play, as well as the baseball um, or football game that you would press the buttons and you would control the uh, baseball players or football players, which is really neat. And of course, we have our um, Red Baron um, airplane and our doll. Now this particular doll that we have can only sleep. So if you lie her down, and she's from the 1920s, you lie her down, her eyes will close. Um, but the particular doll that's advertised there on the bottom could sleep, walk, and cry. So it cost a little more. So it was about $2.10 versus a doll like I affectionately call her Patsy would have probably cost a minimum of a dollar that time. And we start to see the full commercialization of Christmas with an interesting 1928 uh, uh, LA Times advertisement. You see good old St. Nick asking the um, pocketbook to open wider. And this is not going to hurt one bit with Christmas spirit as laughing gas and the young flapper lady right in the background coming in with more gifts. Now, some of these gifts are um, advertisements are from magazines and newspapers such as the LA Times, but also of um, Better Homes and Gardens, uh, Modern Priscilla, 
um, and pamphlets that were ad created by stores just like the Broadway Los Angeles department store to kind of show what their uh, merchandise, um, what they had and how they really stress these modern gifts for folks that will last for years. We see some more ads regarding Christmas tree decorations. Now, interestingly enough, I originally, upon studying and doing research, thought that the um, tinsel or the rainbow icicles were just mainly in the color of silver, but it turns out that it did not just come in silver as that article on the bottom shows there, new rainbow icicles. It actually came in different colors, such as green and red. And we also see the um, actual 1920s uh, bulb and string of lights uh, for a Christmas tree. Um, that's Santa Claus Christmas lights. So those would have probably cost equivalent to what the ad you see there up at the top, about 98 cents to a, about $2. And we also have uh, another Better Homes and Gardens um, article that really gives a guide to people interested in lighting not only their homes in the inside, but also their homes on the outside. So exterior lights and what could be done during that time. Another very unique piece in our collection is the tree lighter base with the three different color bulbs there. And in the center is a reservoir for water and the middle is a steel clamp to hold in a tree. Now, I don't see no problem with electricity near water, you? <laughs> and this, interestingly enough, is also something that we found in a Los Angeles Times ad dated December 9th, 1928. And a tree lighter base such as this with its set of three bulbs would cost about $5. But for an outdoor set, it was about $3.50. Now we have another video to share with you and that is the dining room of La Casa Nueva. Here we see the formal dining room of La Casa Nueva where Mr. Temple would have hosted his parties for friends and families. We see the dining table fully decorated with its table settings and centerpieces researched and inspired by 1920s magazines such as Better Homes and Gardens, Women's Home Companion, as well as cookbooks with table setting instructions. I'll play that for you one more time. Now, everything in this um, setting, most of the tableware is authentic to the time period. And a Christmas feast. Although the Christmas dinner found in the modern Priscilla magazine page on the left called for a uh, roasted goose with apple stuffing, we could only find a faux turkey. Um, on a preservation note, we cannot um, have real food on display within the historic structure for obvious reasons, such as food being an attractant to pests and an infestation would be extremely detrimental to our historic collection. So the next best thing is to use faux foods. Um, and for this, we have a source. We make purchases through a company called Iwasaki. Now they cater to all who need faux foods, whether it's for commercials or ads or museums. Now to save on costs, I decided several years ago, uh, based on further research of the Temple family with their family roots, not only stemming from England, but also of Latino ethnicity, as well as cooking guides, that it was time the family also had some tamales on the table aside from their faux turkey. Um, as historically accurate as it may be, the Mexican cookery guide up at the top there 
It called for canned tamales and it didn't seem as appetizing as fresh tamales. So uh, tamales are made of masa or corn dough, lard and meat that's traditionally, traditionally made out of pork with red chili sauce and it's wrapped in corn husks and steamed until um, steamy perfection. Now, again, of course, we can't have real food on the table. So that close-up image of those tamales um, shows you my attempt at making fake tamales. I could, I, although I found examples of faux tamales, um, they were not as accurate as I would like them to look. So how I did this was I actually went to the store and I bought corn husks. And in order to prevent any type of pest infestation, if there was any little critters on them, I boiled them in a pot and then I froze them for a period of three days. So that would eliminate any pest infestation if there was any, which I didn't see, um, but I did it just to be safe. Then what I did was I dried them, air dried the um, corn husks. And in order to get the structure to look like a tamale, I used um, ethafoam. Now what ethafoam is, is a polyethylene flexible type of plastic that's used for cushioning um, objects, historic objects, whether they're in transit to another place or they're stored, they're delicate and they have to be stored in a box and to kind of help prevent damage from movement and shiftment. So, I found another unique way to use ethafoam and I cut pieces to the dimensions of the corn husks. And really all I did was find an image of meat online and I cut them out and then I secured them around the ethafoam and voila, you have your fake tamales on the tree. Not on the tree, on the table, am I thinking? Okay, now this here, we see the centerpieces and the table decoration um, inspiration um, from a magazine um, advertisement. Now, although there are some similarities and there are some differences, uh, we strive to always be as historically accurate as possible. But again, I added some elements based on not just the general 1920s, um, uh, examples, but also taking into account the Temple family personal histories. So for example, we know that one of the sons of Walter and Laura Temple, um, his name was Walter, uh, Walter Temple Jr. He was very artistic and he had wonderful um, skills. So it was considered that it would be really nice to kind of add a touch of the little arts and crafts element there of Santa's toy shop, as well as Santa and his reindeer on the side of the um, winter Christmas trees with the ribbon going to each particular table, uh, table setting. Now in the music room, we have on top of the um, baby grand piano, goose feather Christmas trees or artificial trees. Now the small trees are made out of goose feathers that are dyed in um, the color green and they are attached to wire branches and held secured by um, a wooden base. Uh, historians believe that the artificial trees started in Germany during the 1800s as a way to save and preserve their woodlands. The trees um, really gained popularity in the United States, especially when Sears and Roebuck featured advertisements, such as the one on the right, uh, of these imported trees during their 1920s uh, catalogs. However, their popularity declined um, the next decade in the 30s um, as real Christmas trees were in high demand and the industry of the Christmas trees uh, became a profitable business. But it's really interesting to note the, the details of uh, the, this particular ad. So you see, you can purchase a 22 inch tree with 18 branches for 33 cents. But if you really wanna go extravagant and you get an 84 inch Christmas tree, uh, goose feather artificial tree, 
you would have to splurge a little more, that's over $6 for that. And here is a video of the room. And we still see some elements of the Victorian era with the um, glass blown um, ornaments. So we see those connections to the past and present. Now, I wanna wish you all a happy holidays and Merry Christmas. And I wanted to end our tour with a um, tree song that was found in one of our Christmas activity books of the 1920s. So this is a little ditty, a little song to sing or a little poem to read after you um, decorate your Christmas tree. So it says, put the star on top of the tree, hang the tinsel bows, drape the garlands red and green in shining colored rows. And then with hands joined in a ring, we'll dance around the tree and sing. Thank you all for your participation. And I hope you continue as best you can your holiday and or Christmas traditions despite um, the state of, of the pandemic. I know it's a rough time and it is truly difficult to be away from social interactions with our loved ones. But I hope that this particular tour gave you some inspiration and maybe to think back on some beautiful memories that, that you have regarding holiday season. So I hope um, that one day we'll see each other face to face once the pandemic is over and you can actually experience, if you can, the um, historic site at the Homestead Museum. Thank you all so very much. And it was a pleasure to work on this particular um, tour with you. Thank, Thank you, you Michelle. Um, we have a, a, some more memories coming in. Um, one from Heather who was sharing that for Christmas dinner, we always had Christmas crackers, you know, the paper tubes that had the strings to pull. Absolutely. Uh, and you would pull them with a friend, um, and which caused the small bang scattering confetti <laughs> inside, which was super festive with, you know, you'd get the great little paper hat, which we mm -hmm. often enjoyed at our staff parties, didn't we? Yes. Very much so. Lots of thank yous. Claudia says, thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Annette Claudia. says, thank you. Heather says, lovely presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm Anne so Marie. glad. Thank you. And Marie called it an enchanting trip to the past, which was so nice. <laughs> That's thank wonderful. Thank you from thank Christine. Uh, Jennifer says, oh, wonderful information and images. Thank you, Michelle. Did you decorate this year or are these views of the house in years past? Great question. Some of the images are a mixture of both. So I did decorate, um, but unfortunately due to the pandemic and the limited amount of time that we are allowed on site and staffing issues, we were, I was only able to decorate um, only four rooms really. So um, I wasn't able to go all out um, this year, but some of the images that you saw, so for example, the living room with the uh, gray paper, that was something that I did put up um, not too long ago, uh, about a week ago. And then another example is the image of the large Christmas tree in the main hall of La Casa Nueva. That was several years back. So there was a mixture. I think you're being modest, Michelle. I really oh. appreciate how much you really wanted to create a special Christmas no. program and <laughs> how much we miss having visitors at the site. Janet had a similar comment. She said, and this is our Janet Austin. So hello, oh, Janet. Janet. She said, you didn't really decorate the houses this year, did you? I so really yes, Janet, to. she did just a little. <laughs> <laughs> and Janet also remembers having real candles on her tree in the UK when she was growing up. Now ask Janet something for me if, if you- You ask her, she's here. <laughs> Janet, um, did you call the, um, the candles on the tree tapers or were they just candles? Okay, we'll wait for her to reply. In okay. the meantime, 
I'll share. Um, Jan uh, says, lots of fun. Lead tinsel was still available in the 1950s, I think. Much better than the plastic tinsel that was always full of static. So and I, I think, think they, yeah, and the aluminum ones were not that much better, but we're a little safer than the tinsel though. Right. Jody <laughs> says, thank you. You brought back wonderful memories of historical things mother had on the tree from the 1920s, oh, which welcome. is so nice to hear. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so this is also coming uh, from Jennifer. She said, we ended up decorating the Gamble House this year too. Um, but uh, with same limitations, with some limitations. Unfortunately, we had to cease exterior touring last week. So now no one is looking at, looking in on it. So I know that hurts, doesn't it, Jennifer? It does. But you know, the, the love and passion that we all have for whether we're decorating a historic site or our own homes, there's something to be said about continuing that tradition, even though it might be limited. Yes, and now Janet got back to us. Here she is. She said, I think we only call them candles. We also had Christmas crackers, of course, and I bought some for this year too. Wonderful, and I hope you have a Merry Christmas, uh, Janet. Okay, we'll give folks a minute or two more. If there are any questions you had about Anything you saw, if this brought up any memories, we would love to hear them. Um, in the meantime, as you all take a minute or two to maybe type type or um, some things in the Q&A or chat, we will let you know that if you have any questions about anything you heard today, um, you have Michelle's contact information here. That's her email address, m.muro at homesteadmuseum.org. We are trying our very best um, to be active on our social media. And some of you watch today on Facebook Live and maybe are watching a recording now. So thank you so much for joining us that way. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Homestead Museum. We also update our website regularly and we'll have some information about programming for January up uh, hopefully by the end of next week. So please check out homesteadmuseum.org too. And we are really doing our best to keep uh, sharing content on our blog. And you can check that out at homesteadmuseum.blog. And let's see, we've got a couple more things coming in here. Let's see what I've got here, Michelle. Okay. Uh, Janet says, enjoyed the program and seeing the houses. Thank you. Have a happy Christmas to everyone. Thank you, Janet. All right. It looks like that might be it for us today. Thank you so much, Michelle, for, for putting some spirit into the season here. Absolutely. Um, yeah. We hope you have a wonderful holiday season, everyone. Thanks so much for staying engaged with us. We see so many familiar names and, and we really appreciate that you're keeping that community going. Yeah. So enjoy the holidays as best you can, stay safe, and we'll look forward to seeing you at more upcoming programs. And thank you, Michelle, so much for this yes. wonderful tour. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you. Right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.